The saga of Harald Hardreda is an incredible one. He was a true Viking's Viking. The son of a noble, exiled after battle at just 15, who founded a mercenary company, embarked on wild adventures, served as a ranging guard to the Byzantines, kidnapped their princess, blinded their emperor, and escaped with enough gold and glory to forge an empire that stretched across the North Sea. Gather round the mead hall and let us sing of his tale. Such glorious adventures would resound through the halls of Scandinavia, inspiring countless generations of Vikings. But what sagas will be told of your feats if the Vikings and Romans clashed once again in 2021? You can find out through our sponsor Rise of Kingdoms. Rise of Kingdoms is a real-time strategy game featuring 12 diverse civilizations, including Rome, Britain, Byzantium, the Vikings, and many more. Each has their own unique bonuses, architecture, and units, led by legendary commanders. Organize your troops to match the various skills of each commander or scenario, and you will defeat much stronger enemies. You can compete with 100 million players on a huge shared map to build cities, form alliances, explore new lands, and battle for control of the kingdom in real-time combat. Upgrade buildings, train soldiers, level up commanders, download, and create your empire in Rise of Kingdoms. Right now, the final round of the civilizational competition has the Romans and Vikings pitted in an epic duel. Which side do you think will come out on top? Support your choice and help out the channel by downloading the game today using the link in the description below. Join the event to have a chance to win awards like the iPhone 13, AirPods Pro, and more. Enjoy! A brief note on historiography and context will be needed before we begin. For starters, it must be pointed out that the 11th century life of Harald Hardreda is a patchwork of real and mythical tales cobbled together from various sources. Some hard facts tie aspects of the story to reality, but modern scholarship casts doubt on the more fanciful aspects of his adventures. For instance, one of our most complete sources on his life comes from the Hymskringla, written by the poet historian Snorri Strulsson about 160 years after his death. There is speculation that stories from this and other sagas borrow from or amalgamate the deeds of other figures, while heaping on top of this layers of narrative flourish which, while entertaining, are of dubious authenticity. Even the name Hardreda is just an anglicized epithet originally meaning something in Norse like the ruthless or harsh ruler, which was coined by his political opponents in the late 13th century sagas. In reality, he probably went by the name Harald Fairhair or Harald Sigurdsson. All this to say is that you should take our tale today with a healthy grain of salt. But that's what legends are made of. And so with that being said, let's get started. At the time, the lands of Denmark, Norway, and England had been united as a grand North Sea Empire by Swain Forkbeard. However, the death of this conqueror in 1014 once again splintered the realm, casting his heirs against one another. According to tradition, Harald was born around 1015 the following year to Sigurd Seer, a Norwegian petty king of the upland region of Ringerike. The family was quite well off politically, as Harald's older brother Olaf II currently sat atop the throne of Norway following his victory at the Battle of Nesjar in 1016. Thus, a young Harald was inspired by the great men of his youth, reportedly displaying a fierce spirit of ambition. This would serve him well in the days ahead. Across the seas, Knut the Great had slowly been piecing back together the North Sea Empire of his father. In the summer of 1015, he had reinvaded England, finally claiming victory in 1017. The following year he took the crown of Denmark, making further moves to fight the Swedes and consolidate his rule. In 1028, this involved sailing to Norway and bullying Olaf II off the throne. However, in 1030, this half-brother of Harald would return to claim what was his, a move that culminated in the Battle of Stiklestad. Here, Olaf fielded a force of some 3,000 men made up of his remaining loyal troops and new allied contingents. Apparently, a 15-year-old Harald had even gathered 600 men from his father's lands who now took their position on the right. Against them stood a host roughly twice their size, made up of wealthy farmers, rival nobles, and the bondsmen loyal to or bought off by Knut the Great. Regardless of this fact, Olaf's army bravely charged downhill, slamming into the host. From there, the battle devolved into a bloody and confused melee. As the battle lines blurred and the ground ran slick with blood, Overhead, the sun darkened with an eclipse, casting the entire struggle into shimmering shadow. According to the sagas, 
Olaf received a series of severe wounds, culminating with a final spear thrust through his belly and a sword blow to the throat. With this loss, the battle quickly dissolved into a rout. Harald too was wounded in the action, but was thankfully saved by the warrior Roggenwald, who had been tasked with protecting the prince's life, and now dragged him through the forest to safety. The following verse has been attributed by some to this harrowing escape. Quote, Through endless woods I crawl, on my way now with little honor, who knows but that my name may yet be far and wide renowned. As a close relative to the fallen Olaf, and one who had taken up arms against Knut, Harald had little hope of safety back home. He therefore laid low on a remote farm, recovering from his wounds before escaping east to Sweden. Here he regrouped with the remnants of the defeated army and plotted their next moves. They appear to have turned to Olaf's old political connections for support, which eventually brought them to the land of the Rus in 1031. The arrival of such a band of warriors was not uncommon in this period, as a market for mercenary work had actually developed across the region. Thus, Harald and his warband in exile soon found themselves in the employ of Prince Yaroslav the Wise. Such mercenary contracts were likely structured in 12-month rotations. During this time, the prince would have sustained the men with basic food and supplies, with the handsome payout coming at the end of the year. In the trade hubs of Kiev and Novgorod, these were probably payments in kind made with furs or other valuable goods. This arrangement proved beneficial to both parties and would see Harald and his men serve loyally for about three years. The young noble was still under 18 years old and likely served as a lesser officer with command over just a small body of troops. These may have assisted the Grand Prince's tax collectors. It was a common but dangerous profession for mercenary soldiers. Collection could prove difficult and intimidation or a strong arm was sometimes needed to wrestle coins from the purses of the locals. There was also the matter of transport. The taxman's caravan of grain, animals, and coin was a tempting target for the bandits and steppe raiders who stalked these lands. But even this did not seem to phase the ambitious young Harald. If anything, it kept the men sharp and allowed them to show off their military prowess. This seems to have earned them the Grand Prince's respect. The next assignment involved joining him on campaign against the Poles and various neighboring rivals. Following these campaigns, Harald and his now veteran company was tasked with assisting in the resettlement and colonization efforts meant to tame the steppe. This drew the ire of the fierce Pechenegs. They were powerful, numerous, and hostile. Yet even when faced with raids from these foes, Harald was said to have led his men to victory. These tours of duty cemented the relationship between Harald and Yaroslav and would prove critical in the future. However, by around 1033, the now 18-year-old Norwegian was ready for his next move. The sagas claim that Harald now requested Yaroslav's daughter, Elisaveta's hand in marriage. But the Grand Prince refused him, saying that he first needed to prove himself as a great warrior by seeking out wealth and prestige of his own. Only then would Yaroslav allow this exiled Norwegian prince to marry his beautiful daughter. And so, Harald turned south to the riches of distant Miklagard, where it was said anything was possible for a man with a strong arm and quick mind. Packing up their belongings, he and his merry band navigated their way to the Dnieper and sailed down to the Black Sea. The journey was long, but it proved yet another opportunity for Harald to win over the former housecarls of King Olaf. Finally, they arrived at their destination. The saga goes as follows. Quote, Bleak gales, lash prows, hard along the shore. Iron shielded, our ships rode proud to harbor. Of Miklagard, our famous prince first saw the golden gables. Many a sea ship, fine arrayed, swept toward the high-walled city. They arrived in the early summer of 1034. Likely landing in the port of Mamas, they followed in the footsteps of previous mercenaries who had established a community in the area. Various goods were traded to finally turn their years of work into hard cash, and upgrades were made to their gear. Within a short time, they resembled the rest of the decked out Varangians of the city. Now it was time to find their new employer. Currently, this would be the freshly remarried Empress Zoe and her low-born husband Michael IV. Here, the stories diverge. In one version, Harald attempted to keep his identity hidden as it might be dangerous for one with his sort of royal blood and powerful enemies. In another version though, Harald presents himself to the Empress and Emperor as royalty and gains their formal recognition, as well as Zoe's barely concealed lust. 
This last part though reads as a boastful tale shared in the meat halls and likely didn't happen this way. Either way, he and his company of 500 men were hired into the Hitiri as the lowest tier of the sailing Varangians. To newcomers though, this was a huge step up which allowed them to amass even greater fortunes, trolling the sea lanes looking for pirate ships to plunder in the crown's name. According to the sagas, they filled four vessels which fell under the command of a general by the name of Girger. This may have been the Norse name for the formidable Byzantine strategos named George Moniakis. Greek sources describe him as a man standing nearly 10 feet tall with a deep voice that dominated both the court and the battlefield. Under his command, Harold's Varangians spent the year chasing down sleek Arabic pirate vessels across the Aegean and raiding their bases of support along Anatolia. This was a Viking's dream job. By 1035, they seemed to have had sufficiently impressed the Byzantines to the point that they were promoted into the Varangian mercenary group serving with the Imperial Army. Snorri Sturluson claims that the roughly 20-year-old Harold was even made leader over all the Varangians, owing to his charisma and reputation. Now, these foreigners joined the next Byzantine counteroffensive, which pushed the Arabs out of Anatolia and into northern Mesopotamia. Here, he is reputed to have sacked and razed twice 40 fortresses. We should note though that 80 seems to be the generic Norse term for a lot, so while he probably didn't sack 80 Arabic fortresses with just 500 men, what he did manage was no doubt impressive. The following verse was likely written by Harald himself as a memoir to that campaign. Quote, One other time there was, when I reddened blades from my homeland, the sword singing in the Arab town, and yet that was long ago. For the next seven years, Harald would find himself in the thick of every major imperial campaign across virtually every frontier, from the great war fleet sent to recover the lands of Italy and Sicily in the west, to the wars against the Serbs, Bulgarians, and Pechenegs in the north. He is also reported to have been commander of a mission to Jerusalem, escorting masons and architects who had been dispatched by the emperor to restore the church of the holy sepulchre and to fight various battles in the area. All of this action would be the fodder of later skjalds who would sing of the endless adventures of Harold the Ruthless, the Hammer, the Thunderbolt, the Bulgar Burner. Diving further into our sources, you also find all kinds of amazing stories about his adventures. For instance, while campaigning in Sicily, there was a series of four castles, each of which Harald endeavored to take by different ploys. At the first castle, he is said to have observed the coming and goings of small nesting birds from the fortifications. These he ordered his men to catch. They then tied burning material to their backs, released them back to their homes, and watched as hundreds of fires broke out across the thatched roofs of the castle, precipitating its surrender. At the second castle, Harold and his men found a hidden place behind a stream and dug a long tunnel beneath the fortifications. When the moment was right, his men then removed the final bricks above them, bursting into the midst of a feast and taking the place by storm from within. At the third castle, both attackers and defenders found themselves in a drawn out stalemate. During this time, Harold had his men disarm and play games out in the open, just out of bowshot. This routine habituated the guards to their innocuous activity. However, one day, the Varangians went to their game with hidden weapons. At a sudden command, they dashed for the gatehouse, gaining control after a confused bloody melee and allowing the rest of the army to flood in. But to take the fourth and largest castle required the greatest ruse of all. What happened is that when Harald fell ill, rumors on both sides abounded that he was on the verge of death. One day, the Varangians announced his passing and parlayed with the priests of the castle to have him buried inside the local church. These agreed, believing that this would bring them great wealth of presents in exchange. Thus, a small procession was allowed to carry the coffin of Harald within. However, the commander was very much alive, and once inside the group drew their weapons, striking all those around them and using the coffin to prop open the gates for the rest of the Varangians who swiftly followed to take the keep. Through these campaigns, Harald's fame and wealth grew to unprecedented heights, with his vast hordes of plunder being sent back for safekeeping in the lands of his friend and ally, Yaroslav the Wise. Yet his fortunes would take a sharp turn at the end of 1041. Michael IV died in December, leaving behind his nephew, Michael V, to rule alongside Empress Zoe. The new emperor, however, was quick to make enemies, countermanding many of his late uncle's decisions and coming into conflict with most of the powerful figures of the realm. Among his targets was the 27-year-old Harald Hardreda, who was thrown in prison. 
The charges vary among our sources, ranging from that of defiling a noble woman, to committing murder, or yet the worst sin of all, defrauding the emperor of his treasure. Around this same time, just four months into his ascension, Michael also deposed his aunt, the beloved Empress Zoe. This proved too much for the people of Constantinople, who erupted into revolt. Church bells soon rang out as the Patriarch of Constantinople called the city to arms. In the streets, the citizens bayed for blood, howling for the return of their Empress. This must have brought a smile to Harold's face as he sat in his dark cell, listening to the riots beyond, and perhaps even singing a gleeful tune. But the Emperor would not go down without a fight. His grand domestic, the commander-in-chief of the army named Constantine, leapt into action. Troops were mobilized to contain the flames of revolt and defend the imperial palace. Armed with his own cohort of Varangians, as well as units of bowmen and ballistas, the streets leading to the Emperor's quarters were locked down. Meanwhile, a dispatch was immediately sent to recall the exiled Empress Zoe, in hopes that her reappearance would cool the situation. The surrounded bodyguard of the Emperor managed to hold the line for a few more hours, until being reinforced in the evening by veteran units who cut their way through the crowds. Night set upon a city under siege. A rising sun brought hope to the Emperor. However, this would be dashed with the escape of Harald from prison. The sagas disagree with the manner of his escape, but the end result was the same. Now freed, Harald took a stand with the rioters. His release acted as a lightning rod for the opposition, rallying his followers and even turning loyalist Varangians of the city away from the Emperor. Together, these shock troops now smashed through the remaining imperial cordon in a three-pronged assault. The streets to the palace were blown wide open, and soon, a flood of looters and rioters crashed upon the inner gates. In this frenzied chaos, it was reported that 3,000 people died. At the fore of this human wave were Harald and his Varangians. According to legend, these burst into the imperial bedchambers. Harald himself is said to have grabbed a panicked Michael, castrating the emperor before blinding him, but rather than commit regicide, he tossed the still breathing victim to the ground, abandoning him to his fate. Another account tells of how the emperor actually fled the scene to a nearby monastery, only later being discovered and blinded by a furious crowd who handed him over to the Varangians. In the aftermath, Empress Zoe was restored to the throne. Harald, though, sensed that the situation was too hot for him and requested permission to return home to Norway. When this was refused, he again took matters into his own hands. A saga tells of how one night, he and the Varangians scrambled to collect their goods, even breaking into the imperial apartments to kidnap the sleeping empress's niece before running off down the halls. They then hurried to the Varangian docks, commandeered a pair of galleys, and rowed off. Yet while the Northmen had outrun the alarm, they now came face to face with the great sea chains that blocked their exit. Undaunted, Harald would find a way. He ordered half of his men to the back of the ship, tipping its bow up while the rest rowed as hard as they could. Thus, the ships ran up onto the chain itself. At this point, he ordered them all to run to the front. His own galley creaked and groaned, but finally slid past the tipping point, splashing into the water on the other side. Unfortunately, their second vessel cracked in the attempt and became stuck. What goods and men could be spared were transferred over while the rest was left behind. Meanwhile, the kidnapped princess was dropped ashore and given a farewell message to relay to the Empress Zoe. They were free. The sagas conclude this chapter as follows. Past wide plains we flew, a dauntless never wearied crew. Our Viking steed rushed through the sea, as Viking like fast, fast sailed we. Never I think along this shore did Norsemen ever sail before. Yet to the Russian queen I fear, my gold adorned, I am not dear. We hope you've enjoyed this first episode on the adventures of Harald Hardreda. It's been an absolute blast to share this more narrative-driven tale of history, but let us know what you think of the format, and stay tuned for the rest of the story. A big thanks to the patrons for funding the channel, and to the researchers, writers, and artists for making this episode possible. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content, and check out these other related episodes. See you in the next one.